Our objective for this session is basically for them to share their experience. They are all unique in different ways. Um, for instance, if I start from Ibukun Awoshika, the chairman of First Bank, she's been an entrepreneur all her life. And she's also into a lot of community initiatives, trying to get entrepreneurs um, to um, grow, especially young ones. Um, how has she used the power of networking, for instance, um, to succeed in her, um, in her career so far, even though she's an entrepreneur? If you take Bola Adeshala, she spent all her years in banking, um, both in Nigeria and outside Nigeria, and she's been an ED in First Bank before becoming the MD of Standard Chartered Bank. Um, that's a unique position to be in as well. We'd like her to share what the playbook, you know, is like sharing her own experience so you can design your own playbook, like Carla said, in a manner that you can progress faster and achieve much more than any one of them may have achieved. And Aisha is one of us. She's a charter holder. She's also been... <laughs> um, she's been in banking. I'm in a commercial bank, she's worked in various areas, and now she's the um, deputy governor in the central bank, the first female to be the deputy governor for her directorate. Her directorate is Financial System Surveillance and Stability. She's the very first woman to occupy that role. So that's also unique. So I'd like you to begin to post your questions very early on while I start the discussion. So I'm going to ask each one of them. I'll start with Ibuko. Can you please share with us um, how you have used networking? Because a lot of people say networking is essential to career growth and for you to be able to achieve your goals. Kala alluded to that through her talking about relationships being important. How have you been able to use it positively to enhance um, what you have been able to achieve so far? Ibuko. <laughs> I didn't realize. Can you hear me? Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here, and thank you for inviting me. Well, I think uh, where I'd like to start from is uh, by some fluke. The three of us are Wimby's people. <laughs> Bola and I are co-founders of Wimby's. And, f and the three of us are former chairpersons of Wimbase. Yeah. So that tells you there is something great about the power of relationships. Because, you know, I, I use the word relationship more than the word network. What I have found is worthwhile is building relationships. And that comes from you having a sense of your own value system <coughs> and where you're going. You know, as a young business person, starting out from the age of 25, I said to myself two things I was never going to do. Never going to uh, pay a bribe, and I was never going to sleep with a man to get a job. Now, that seemed like something that was going to be tough in this environment. But I also then realized that in order to create advantages for myself, if I wasn't going to do those things, I had to build relationships. And so I went into every job or every company I was going after with the intention to connect such that you were willing to give me a chance of fight for me beyond what I couldn't give to you. And it comes in very simple ways. It's making sure you treat other people like they matter because they do. It's paying attention to little things, birthdays, uh, showing up when you should, and being deliberate in being courteous and considerate of other people. But beyond that also, is you must show up that you can deliver on what you've been asked to. So you do your job, you earn the respect of the others, but you treat the other people well. And then, a step at a time, because relationships are not momentary, they're things you do over time. And paying attention to that has been key. The other part that's worked for me effectively, well, one of the key parts, Wimbase, 17 years of the investment of the 12, the 13 of us that started Wimbase, and the, multi, the thousands of women that have been part of Wimbase over the years, is we have paid attention to empowering each other and supporting each other. We created Wimbase as a, as a platform to deliberately act as the catalyst to elevate the profile of women 
through relationships. So we speak up for people. We show up for people. We make recommendations to people. Bola and I will tell you that there are many times you're asked to sit somewhere and you know that it's not one more thing you want to do. But you're going to tell them, but I know who you should have. And once you know who they should have, then you go on and send the name of some girls. And what we've done is we've institutionalized that in like our wing board program and a lot of things that we do. So in terms of relationships are not just casual. You show up, because when I say to people, you want to give me your CV, I first want to spend time with you. I know that <laughs> when I say that I'm recommending you, I know you. And that person who is going to trust me to recommend, I can trust you first before I send you to the other person. So it's about relationships. Show up, be competent, be capable, and then respect other people. And then you would see that things happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Awishika. Um, I'll come to Mrs. Adishola now. Could you please share what you see as a key to having proper relationships and networking? Thank you very much, um, Shadi. I will first um, congratulate um, the CFA, the Women in Investment, because um, I was there last year when, you were, when uh, yeah. Women in Investment launched, and um, it, was a, it was a wonderful ceremony, and I'm glad to be back here um, again uh, today. Um, well, my, my own um, experience in relation to networking, and I think it's needless to um, define networking. I think Carla put perspectives around it, and I think Ibuku has spoken about um, relationships. Um, but for me, from a personal perspective, um, I think it's about um, mutual benefit in relationships. Um, just as Ibuku said, sponsorship, um, knowledge, and for me, the most important thing about the relationships that um, I try and build uh, and the networks that I try and nurture uh, or create uh, is about knowledge. And not just knowledge for myself, but knowledge that I can pass on. So um, I, I would put my networks in sort of four broad um, buckets or relationships in four broad buckets. Um, I think the first one would be my network of people who have gone before me. So mentors, um, people who have sponsored me, people who have sought me out because they've taken a particular interest in either my career or my life, um, people I have sought out because I feel that there's much to be learned from sitting at their feet. And I would say that that particular bucket has given me the gift of experience, the gift of knowledge, where people are able to say, you know, point me in the right um, direction. Um, the second bucket, and I think for me the most exciting, um, are those that are coming behind me. Um, younger people, uh, entrepreneurs, junior colleagues. Um, and, and why it excites me is that, particularly in this day and age, it's important that we know what's happening, um, that we get exposed to you know, new technologies, the buzzwords, and so on. Um, when I look at uh, my bank, um, the average age is probably slightly under the age of 30. And as we know in Nigeria, 60-65% of the population is also under the age of 30. So I think it's important as I you know, creep towards 60 that um, I have a feel and I can feel the pulse of that generation. And so I actively seek out younger people to have relationships with and they also seek me out. And I'll give one quick example. I was on a plane um, about six months ago, you know, trying to get some sleep. And you know, you always have one person on a plane who decides to keep walking up and down, greeting everybody and making a whole lot of noise. So <laughs> somehow I was woken up by some buzz and activity and people were taking selfies with a young chap. So I thought, what's going on here? And uh, this one walking up and down had worked with me many years ago. So as soon as he spotted me, he said, ah, you have to meet um, this person. So he brings this guy who's been sitting opposite me, everybody trying to get some sleep brings him to me and says, um, and introduces him um, as um, one of the sort of, you know, newest hits in, in, in music. And I thought, okay, so. Um, <laughs> they said, I know, but you have to know him. And then I turned around to the young chap and I said, so what's your name? When he mentioned his, his name, I almost collapsed. And I thought, my children worship you. you know? <laughs> oh my God, you're my children's hero. <laughs> Mr. Easy. <laughs> So, 
I took my own selfie, which I quickly put in, you know, in the send uh, box. But the interesting thing was, a few days later, he sent me a note. And he just said, um, nice meeting you on the plane, and I hope that, you know, I can stay in touch. And I then sent him back a note saying, you know, I was very impressed with your telling me about your business. He's doing all sorts of things, fantastic work. I said, I'm very impressed. Stick to your core, stick to your principles, and just blessed him and, and prayed for him. And then last weekend, I got a WhatsApp from him. It was a PowerPoint presentation. He's about to launch like an X Factor for 100 young uh, musicians, and he's going to give $300,000 of his own money to these young people. So he sends me this PowerPoint and says, please, could you take a look at it? and tell me what you think. So we spent one and a half hours going back and forth, you know, tips here and so on and so forth. Um, but for me, I was so fulfilled that evening because I didn't ignore his first message. I was excited when, you know, I knew who he was and, 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 and all that. So I think that what, what my young girl network does for me is the gift of innovation, the gift of youth. The third bucket, before I keep quiet, is... Um, the network of my contemporaries, my professional contemporaries, um, my, my, my social um, friends, you know, I mean, my network of people like uh, Ibukun, and what do they do? I can call and say, you know, I'm not having a good period in, 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 at work, and they would encourage me. Uh, when I have um, suggestions for what they can do, books they can read, or who they can talk to, boards they can sit on, I reach out to them. And so that network of contemporaries, I think for me, is a gift of, motivation to do more, the gift of innovation, a shoulder to cry on, and just, you know, go out and, you know, have a drink and, and, and whatever. And the final bucket are my support structures. So my family, I have the best in-laws in the world, my friends, co-parents, I have, I have twin teenagers, so I need a network of younger parents who are most of them 20 years younger than me. So that network of, of, of co-parents, my, my association of former nannies and house helps, the support structures, <laughs> yes, the support structures that give me peace, the support structures that mean I can just be myself and achieve because the, infra the domestic and familial infrastructure is there to support me. And I would say that what they give me is the gift of love, the gift of understanding. Um, and maybe I'll talk a bit later on about how I nurture um, those networks. But for me, those are sort of my broad um, spectrum of, 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 of networks that keep me going. Thank you very much, Mrs. Adeshala. Now we go on to the Deputy Governor. And um, she would answer the same question very quickly because um, um, she's much younger than the other two, so we want her to connect, to be the connecting factor to the people in, the, um, in that age range. So please, Mrs. Ahmad. No pressure. <laughs> Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, it's great to be here. Good morning to everyone. It's nice to be back in the CFA community, in the Wimbis community. It's good to see everybody. Um, so... For me, in one word, I'm that person that, well, I used to be, that person that, you know, goes up and down and greeted everybody. Um, it has always come naturally to me. I'm very interested in people, and, you know, that's way everything just evolves. I think that networking is more than just an event. It's more than just you want to get someone's attention at an industry conference or a party. The opportunities are there in your everyday life. So the same way people talk about oh, eating healthy, living healthy must be a lifestyle. I think networking is also, and building relationships must be a lifestyle. Why are we talking about this? And pardon me to the, to the men, because I took a slightly different Islam. This is a women's investment conference. I thought I'd look at some of the disparities, you know. We're talking about this because there are too few women in leadership, and we're trying to look for what the success factors are. What are the men doing well, you know, and how can we get more women there? Um, you would expect, because women usually have, well, we're seen as better social, we connect easy, easier. We do a lot of the emotional labor, both at work and at home. By emotional labor, I mean things like making sure the team is working together, making sure that somebody had an issue um, one of your, your team members had a personal issue, the woman is more likely to know and tell the others, and just keeping the fabric of communities together. So you'd expect that because we're doing that, we will be good 
at networking, but men are better than us at it. In fact, there's research that shows that, I think there's a LinkedIn research that says that men are actually better connectors. So women can form deeper relationships, but men form more varied, sort of wider relationships, and they're usually more strategic to leverage those relationships. Why? Three things sort of I identified. One, the shared time. We just don't feel like we have the time as women. You are busy, Carla talked about putting your head down. A lot of us think like that. If I only work so hard, if I only give my best, if I only show this organization that I'm the best person they have, they would promote me, they would increase my salary, they would give me more opportunities, but it's never that way. By the time we finish burning all our energy, we really don't have time to start to think of networking. Two, the issues around what I'll call the chemistry. The truth is that when a man and another man want to try and network, there's no issue of chemistry or whether there's another, you know, motive. But when it's a man and a woman, there's always this thing, right? <laughs> Whatever it is. And you can't blame women that sort of feel like, okay, I don't want to get into that sort of space, you know, and, and things like that. And of course, things like the societal expectation that, we, you know, it sort of reduces the amount of time we have sort of to do, you know, to be more strategic. There's also that whole, people might think you're a hustler. Why are you hustling me? You know, why are you trying to get ahead? Why are you trying to be ambitious? Something that when men do is not seen as negatively. I think to make it easier for us, and this is now for men and women, is to be in your natural space. It's to, it's to trust that those that are of your tribe would naturally be attracted to you. Those that see the potential in you would want to mentor you, would want to um, sort of promote you. I also think that to be a good networker, so when we think about networkers, we think about people that are very confident, very positive, they have good manners, they, they think about people, courtesy, they're widely read, you know, because you have to be widely read to be able to have a, a number of conversations with different people. And you can't have a network that is just restricted to just your, cur like your career. There's so many opportunities. There's church, there's mosque, there's your friends, then there's your old school friends whom, I don't know if about you, usually as you, you finish school, you're always so different. You know, these people end up going to different parts, so keeping them in your life actually enriches that. There's the charity work and things like that. So what I would say is that to, to be considered as a strong networker, you need to be the node. You need to be the one that connects other people. And the only way you can connect other people is when you have a wide sort of variety of those relationships. I think I'll just stop there. Thank you very much. Sorry. I'm sure that we've all learnt a few tips. There are quite a number of questions that have come in. And I'm going to start by um, asking some of those questions. One of which is really how do you find the time um, to keep all these network groups, you know, keep them working in a manner that you, you are able to draw all the benefits out from them. You've got your family, you've got community. You've got to keep this networking thing going. And I'm going to start with um, Ibukuma Woshika, if she doesn't mind. How does she manage the time and still manage her family? Because what we find is that mid-career is when most women actually pull out. When they start having family and then they find out that it's a bit tougher at work. So could you just share some tips to our young women? Okay. I, I think the thing is, um First and foremost, you're not going to spend all of the time with every type of person in your category of network. Um, and you don't need hours to engage with people. My rule is always, you're my friend and my relationship. When you need me, I'm there for you. Which means every time that it counts, I make sure I show up. Because that's when it really counts. My year group, Shade and I are in the same year group from our secondary school. And uh, we have four meetings a year. Maybe in a year, maybe I'll make one. But then I always try to host a Christmas party. 
That's where everybody knows I'm committed, but I don't have the time. And then there's uh, the WhatsApp group. So everybody's birthday, maybe I would have missed three or four because I haven't even gone into the group. And then the day I go, I catch up and send a message. So everybody knows I'm still here, but I'm not readily available. And when you meet people you haven't seen for a while, there's a way you greet people in an off-handish way, and there's a way you like they really count and they matter. So you have to learn skills of engagement that makes people I'm not there, but when you look for me, I would respond. I'm not there, but when I see you, it will be like, gosh, I wish I'd seen you every day for the last two months. You know, you, you sort of do that. Then you have your close friends. The people that are really your friends, who understand your life, will support you through being there and not being there. But I hate social parties in Lagos. But if Bola is having her father's funeral or her mother's funeral or any of her twin daughters are getting married. I will wear everything I need to wear and I will sit there for 10 hours if that's what I need to do. I always call it sacrifice of love. <laughs> I hate the noise. I do not drink. After one glass of water or soft drink juice or something, I'm done. But for that day and that moment, for that friend, it means a lot for me to be there. I will do it. Now, if I'm not there for the next five, six, seven, one, she knows that on the day that it counts, I'm there for you. Now, for business relationships, they're the ones that least require time. They just require acknowledgement and relationships. And it's really, my husband gets mad at walking through the airport, going through places with me. He's like, must you greet everybody? <laughs> so I'm like, what? Do I say, sorry, I can't greet you today because my husband doesn't like me talking to everybody. <laughs> so I always say to him, look, for me, maybe it's nothing. But for somebody else that's looking up to you to say hello, it means something. So and because it means something, it would only take 30 seconds to say, hi, how are you? Are you okay? Nice to see you. I've got to run. They're fine. Because that's, that's what it is. And now in this selfie age, ha. Huh, You know, with the young people and all of that on the plane, at the airport, everywhere you go. But they're glad to meet you. They're happy and they're quick to say, you're my mentor. You know, uh, you're my mentor from afar. <laughs> because they don't, I'm so glad to meet you. How can that be a bad thing? I'm glad to inspire one more girl to where she needs to get to. It only costs me a minute or two sometimes, or sometimes five or ten, because you just need to answer the question she has at that moment. It's worth it. As for my peers, we understand each other. If I don't see Bola for one year and I call her now, that phone she's going to pick up. And the same for your friends. You know when you call your friend and you say, look, if, like, the day I, was, I had the conversation about being appointed to the board of First Bank, I wasn't even told I was being appointed to the board of First Bank. I was told I was... Uh, to come and chair the board of the insurance company the bank was just setting up. And I thought, insurance, what do I know about insurance? That's not something I want to do. And the chairman then said to me, look, we've headhunted you for, you've built companies from scratch, you, you have international partnerships, we're building these companies, in, you can do this. And I said, okay, let me go and think about this. Of course, the first person I call is my friend who I know is the friend that has the skills and the capacity to have that conversation with me. And I say, where are you? Go to your house now. <laughs> and then we go and sit down and tear the conversation apart. And then I walk away from there and explain to my husband, explain to another friend, take a few days to pray and decide, okay, do I really want to do this? And then by the time your relationships then say to you, yes, you can, what does that give you? A support group to walk you through your fears and your sense of inadequacies concerning those challenges. And then you know that even when you get to the pitfalls, there would be a team around you to stand with you. So don't kill yourself trying to be everything to everyone. First and foremost, never lose yourself in the process of trying to relate. Relationships are key. Why? Every person around you 
is going to speak for you or speak against you when it counts. So it's not even just the close ones. Remember, what we call the network is everybody that has a view of you. It's not even the people you actually interact with alone. So you have the relationships and you have the general view. And some of those people that have that general view, based on how you acted when they saw you somewhere. So don't go crazy on the street because somebody is going to say, oh, that one, you don't want to touch her. She loses her temper very quickly. I'm saying as a woman, you're going to be deliberate. So in being deliberate, you're going to consciously manage how you behave, how you relate to people, and how you conduct yourself because sometimes you don't know who is in the audience or who is standing around you and every person has a view who is going to speak for or against you somewhere. Thank you. Thank you very much. Those are very valid tips that she has shared. Now I'm going to take one question from the audience and I'm going to ask uh, Mrs. Adishola to please help us with it. And I'm going to combine two questions because one was specifically addressed to you to start with. It says, how do you break into the boys club um, and sh shatter the glass ceiling as a young woman? And then the second one says, um, how do you, as a CEO of a group, can you share some experiences managing the executives in the standard chartered across various geographical locations? I want you to take the two together. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, the question about breaking into the boys club is my club first. So uh, I'm not sure about, <laughs> I, I define the club. Um, so I, I've never sort of really seen it as um, breaking in. I, I think the first thing for, for a lot of women, you know, and I, I tell them is competence. Okay, what do you bring to the table? Because you only talk about club when you are an outsider. And the insiders are bringing value, they're bringing knowledge, they, they, they're growing. Um, so what do you bring to the table? And, and I think that's very critical for, for women. And that's where I go back again to knowledge, sharpening the saw. Um, improving ourselves, taking professional courses, joining, you know, um, credible organizations and so on, so that the scope of your mind is very, very wide and you bring something to the table, so that people see you um, not because you're a woman or try and practice tokenism, but because they see your voice as one that is adding value and that is contributing to what's been done on, at the table. Um, so, for, for me, in, in, in my career, I've never really seen anything, you know, I mean, I don't know about the, 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 the glass ceiling, because that's about setting limits for myself. So, when I look up, I don't see a ceiling. I see what are my aspirations? What do I want to achieve? How do I go about it? How do I prepare? How do I plan? How do I remain passionate about it? How do I give myself the empowerment to achieve? And, you know, the, the limiting factor, and it's one of the things that we've even observed in, in, in Wimbiz sometimes, that women sometimes are our own worst enemies in terms of the limits we set on ourselves, the fear factor, um, the inability to, to, to be courageous, to take risk despite fear, that mindset. Um, and I, I think it's something that, as women, we need to think about. You know, I think, you know, Carla illustrated very much about how we practice these things. You know, at a certain age, it's difficult to change your behavior, but if you adopt habits... I'll give you an example. This morning, I've sent out uh, three WhatsApp messages that just say, how are you? People that just came to my mind. That's how I, net that's how I keep it going. People that just came to my mind. One, a former bank CEO who retired about two years ago. I just thought of him. I said, how are you? Another, a co-parent, you know, to, to, that, I, that I knew from my children's school, how are you? That's the network. So my, I, I, don't, um, I, I don't make my relationships issues based as well. So there's no issue. I don't need anything from anybody. It's just the thought. So the, 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 the glass ceiling, um, for me, I, I, um, I have never seen uh, or experienced any significant impediment to my career except myself. And those are the days when I wake up in the morning, I don't feel like going to work, tuck myself under the blanket, and I, you know, and, you know, just have those bad days. Um, but what do I do? I pick myself up, look at myself in the mirror and think, no, 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 you can't, you know, self-deprecate, you've got to get up and do it. The one about managing, um, you know, cross, um, um, cross border and, 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 and sort of being involved in, in, a, in a big group. Let me rewind first to, uh, an earlier part of my career when I was the CEO of Kakawa Discount House. Now, Kakawa Discount House um, is a securities trading company owned at that time 
by nine of the biggest banks in, in, uh, in Nigeria. And sitting on my board were nine CEOs of the biggest banks in Nigeria. And I was female. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to do it, just like you know, uh, Carla said. The mantra was, you know, I'm not scared. I'm not you know, sort of daunted by these guys who I always used to look up to uh, being my directors. And I sought wisdom from God as to how can I, as much as possible, <clears throat> tap knowledge and strength from them and turn that what could have been fear into value. So I identified the strengths in these gentlemen. Um, if it was in relation to a credit application at, at the board meeting, I knew who was the strongest in credit, and I would see him before and run the ideas through him and get his buy-in. So at the board meeting, if I present it, I fold my arm, he's the one defending it. I found the person who was strongest in governance. And that way, instead of thinking I was managing nine egos, I was actually managing nine experienced people that I was learning from. It was like osmosis. I would stick close to them, make sure everything good from them came into me. So I think it's, a, it's about stakeholder management. The second story, before I keep quiet, is when I joined um, Standard Chartered, again, I'd worked in Citibank for about nine years, so I knew about uh, working for a multinational organization um, you know, across boundaries, multiple jurisdictions, and so on and so forth. So when I joined Standard Chartered, I thought, hmm, we're in you know, close to 80 countries. I've got stakeholders dotted across the globe. Because I do not like my first encounter with people being based on an issue, I'd rather they know me before. I found out who my stakeholders were across the world, about 45 key people who would matter to my success, and I sent them emails within days of joining the bank. And very simple email, greetings from Lagos. Hello, my name is Suso. I just joined Standard Chartered uh, Nigeria as CEO. Um, you know, uh, retail banking is, is doing well. I know you're the global head of retail banking, and I, I believe that you know, we would have a lot to uh, work on together. Please you know, feel free to reach out to me anytime. End of story. And I forgot all about that. And I found that by the time there was an issue, and I was reaching out to an individual, because they had heard from me, um, as a greeting, or somebody gets promoted, I just send a little note, you know, congratulations on, on your new role. It was much easier for me to manage my multiple stakeholders, such that within uh, three months, actually, of joining the bank, I had to make a presentation to our group board. By the following January, we have um, uh, yearly meetings with like the top 150 of us in the bank. I actually did a presentation on Nigeria, so I got so much visibility within the first couple of years, because I actually reached out to them. I wasn't waiting for them to send me you know, a, a, a note about you know, welcome um, on board. So it's not been easy, because there are, again, you know, multiple cultures and so on. But I, 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 I say again, what am I bringing to the table? I'm sorry, what am I bringing to the table? And I think that is what is um, critical in, in managing multi-stakeholder relationships. Thank you very much. Thank you for that comprehensive response. Now, when um, the deputy governor was speaking earlier, she said she is a people's person and it comes naturally to her. Now, I have a question from the audience here that says, most people expect favors from their networks. How do you set boundaries while networking? Where do you draw the lines? I like that question because I don't know if I spent enough time really talking about what has worked for me personally is networking, so if you want to call it networking or relationship building, but for networking's sake. Relationship building for relationship's sake. I know that most times we are trying to invest in people so that later on we can get something out of them, but I honestly want you to know that that has never been my intention. I think what tends to happen is I, w I more want to be seen as the one to go to if you want to meet someone. That's where I'm coming from. Now, if I want to be that node, like I say, be the node that connects people, it then means you have to be varied as well. So I don't know about drawing the line. So I don't know which perspective they're coming from. Are you saying, or how do you, as a, somebody in position, draw the line? Is that the question? The, the, I think the mindset of the person that put it is, when you have a relationship, there are favors that are expected. You need to give favor or something. That okay. How do you then set the limit Thank how you. far you want to go. I get you. That is a very good question for me. Mm -hmm. I do get people call me yeah. for this or for that. And the way I see it is this. If they have access to you, what do you want them to do? They shouldn't call you. If they have an issue, <laughs> they, no, what would you do if it was you? You have an issue and you know someone that can help you with it. 
that's what you would do. You would call the person, you would reach out. I don't really see it as drawing boundaries. I see it more around what can I do? Are you saying they can ask you for anything? Because I think the question is from the limit within of, my yes, yeah. so within my power. Yeah. No, I want to address many things because it's also overwhelming sometimes. I know that people in public service get a lot of this. Mm -hmm. And it can be overwhelming, right? But the way I see it is what is within your power to do? Mm -hmm. And there are many things that are actually within your power to do that does not cross any integrity line or whatever. Fantastic. Just try and do it, regardless of the position that you're in. Of course, if someone asks you whether you're in a position or not, they ask you for something that is not appropriate, that is against the law, whether you were in a position, you will not do it. Right. So for me, I think that's how I deal with that. But I thought it was good for me to also because I didn't really talk about anything personal. Um, what has worked for me, I, I started out in banking um, as a front office person, so I had to deal with clients, I had to go out there, I had targets, you know. And I think when you have targets, people always, always expect that you're going to every networking event and you're trying to get people to be a customer. And I don't know, those are bankers in the room, sometimes, once they hear a banker, okay, no, I have an account, don't talk to me, kind of thing, <laughs> you know. And I'm like, I'm not asking, asking you to open an account. So, in that position, I've had to really genuinely get people to refer business to me. I'd always mostly met my targets. And I've never had to ask one person in a room to say, oh, I'm a banker, please let me, you know, um, set up a relationship with you. Um, it's all about caring about the people genuinely. And I really want to just emphasize this. It's not really about going to the room. They can see the opportunistic thing in your eyes when it's like, <laughs> All you see me as is this other thing. You don't really care about who is standing in front of you. You don't really care to understand who I am. And sometimes you're trying to connect, not for yourself, but for the third party. So I'm like, oh, Tosin, meet Carla, because this is what Carla does. And Tosin, this is what, um, 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 Carla, this is what Tosin does. And I think you guys should hook up, right? And there's no way either of them will be having an event or doing something that will not sort of invite you over. So that's what sort of has worked. And every single opportunity I've gotten, it's all from somebody I sort of met in the past, I helped in the past, or just met me and just felt, I like this young lady's spirit, I'm going to give her an opportunity. And sometimes you don't separate the personal from the professional, in the sense that from the Wimby's angle, for example, I've always been very passionate about Wimby, even more passionate than the people that set it up. <laughs> we are having a meeting. I'm like, no, this is what I think we should do, and this is what we should do. We should attract so many people, we should... Now, they're working with you in that context, but they're also professionals. So if they have opportunities in the professional context, they know that, okay, you're going to bring, if you're committed, if it's something you're interested in, you bring that same passion to what you're doing. So it's this mesh of things that you can't just put apart and say, oh, okay, I'm going to go out there and now I'm going to start networking. You didn't ask me the question about, I'm going to quickly tell you, you didn't ask me the question about the time. But one thing we didn't talk about was technology, because today you don't have to be physically everywhere. You are already on all these different networks, right? You're on LinkedIn, you're on Facebook, you're on um, Instagram, you're and by email, and even WhatsApp. It's all part of it, you know? There are your communities, there are some people that are, okay, there are WhatsApp people, send your one week, once a week WhatsApp. You have to organize yourself on this thing. It has to be a real, I used to have dashboards. <laughs> You know, and I used to look for, I used to try and look for technology then that would help me organize who I've spoken to. Not because I'm trying to really, you know, mind this thing, but I just want to, these people that I've connected with, I want to keep the connections, not only for me, but for everybody else. So there's stuff that you can actually do, but it has to be part of you. It has to be altruistic. You have to come from a position of abundance when you are networking or building relationships. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, Mrs. Aweshika wants to say something. You know, just uh, related to the question of asking, it's important that as you build relationships with people, especially up, don't ask for too many things. Be strategic about what you ask and when you ask. If you ask too often, you depreciate in value. Now, I'm telling you from the, the view from the other side. If you don't ask that often, the day you show up, everybody's going to run around. I'm deliberate about rarely owing people, which means asking for things. So when I make a call, 
people make it important because they know you will. But I'm quick to give when you can give. Now, the, the, the other part of it is just remember whenever you're calling people, there are many other people calling them at the same time as well. So there's opportunity cost in terms of that. And you want to be that valued one that they give priority to when you do. So build relationships, make it genuine and not based on anything you want. But the day there is a, in fact, half the time, what I do, especially with a lot of my younger friends, is I hold people's needs, position, and opportunities in my mind. And when you walk into the right opportunity that is theirs, you call them and say, you know what? I think you need to go and talk to this person. And you do that all the time. Or if I look at someone now, as much as Aisha is part of us at Wimby's, now she's our regulator. She's Bola and I's regulator. <laughs> she, I, but I won't call her often. Why? It's not in her interest for us to have to deal with her in a certain way. Why? Because she's the regulator and we are the banks that are regulated. And if we have good faith towards her and protecting her job and her integrity on the job, then the way we handle that relationship becomes different and with consideration for how that affects her job. That's how you should deal with relationships. Always be considerate of how what you're going to ask and how you relate will influence or affect that person's position. That comes with maturity, but it's good to learn it early. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you can go ahead. People, very well said. Um, I just wanted to um, make a point about um, what you seek is seeking you. And back to Aisha again. I think Aisha is a, is a, is a perfect illustration um, and, and testimony to that statement, what you seek is seeking you. An excellent connector. I remember we were at a conference in Paris um, <laughs> about five, five, six years ago. And um, at the end, and there were many female heads of state, female ministers, prime ministers, and so it was a women's conference. And um, when you see Aisha at those kinds of events, she's moving. And I remember <laughs> whispering to somebody, I said, watch Aisha. Before you knew what was happening, she'd taken photographs with them, she had talk, spoken to them, she was shaking their hands and all that. But you know, what you seek is seeking you. That she's deputy governor of CBN today. It's not, it is not, she is not from, it didn't just drop from the sky. It's about positioning. Positioning for connection and being recognized. It's about speaking up, showing up, sitting up. Because she didn't just sit there, she also improved herself. She spoke up, she was yeah. visible, she was adding value, and that's why she was spotted. The second thing, <laughs> the second thing is, I don't know if you've heard of the six degrees of separation, mm -hmm. okay? So you're, be, you're six people between you and somebody else and the next person, okay? Somebody knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. In today's interconnected world, it's probably three degrees of separation or two degrees of separation because we have technology, and we call one degree of separation, exactly. I can send Carla a mail, even though I'd never met her until this morning, and you know, she either replies or she doesn't, I can, I can you know, keep in touch. So it's important that when we are seeking, some, we should never discount people, because you don't know who knows somebody. These days, I'm, I have a big problem, because a lot of people will come and say, oh, hello, how are you? And I look at them, I can't remember who they are, I smile, I greet them, Occasionally, if I, if I think I know who the person is, I might say, ah, this makeup is wizard real, because I don't recognize anybody <laughs> anymore. <laughs> Ladies, and my, please, don't be offended if I greet you warmly, but I don't remember your name. Because people now look different. You know, now sometimes we have long hair, short hair, <laughs> you know, new eyebrows, do this, that, and the other. So I'm always apologizing to people, say, I'm sorry, I don't know. Oh, I, it's, it's Jockey. Oh, Jockey. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Jockey is gone fairer, you know. <laughs> it's different now. Um, but the, the, the point really is, is that you don't know what the next person could do for you. 
You just don't know. And like Carla said, these days, it's younger people that I've known for many years who are doing the most fantastic things that I can reach out to. You know, some of them offer to say, oh, when your kids are home, you know, let them come and intern with me. So you just don't know where you would need somebody. Let us never, ever turn our noses up on people. It is very, very important. I had senior people reach out to me and say, I've taken an interest in your career. How are you doing? There's a, you know, board role here or a board role there, whether I'm interested or not. So please show up, speak up, sit up as women. Very Thank important. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Adeshala. We, our time is up. There are loads of questions here. But I'm just going to ask us to wrap up. I want each person to just give um, a closing advice. Um, to the women in the, in, in the audience as to what you see as a core tip to hold on to. Just one word for them. One word. Yes, one word. But when I say one word, it means one sentence. I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, you, I will start with you, Aisha. Okay. Um, last night, I asked two men to give me sort of tips, like what they wanted us to like, share as women. And they said, we don't ask enough. We need to ask that, sorry, this is not one sentence, but that, you know, men are not afraid of rejection, and I probably know why, because, you know, they have to try many times. <laughs> so they've gotten a lot of practice. So just keep asking, and I think, Carla, you mentioned talking about the way we think about, oh, they're going to reject me, so ask a lot, and, you know, that we always forget our business cards. I know it sounds very simple, but that it's that we never go out with our business cards, we are never actually ready and intentional. So my two, two sentences will be ask, be confident to ask, 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 and just always be ready. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Adeshala. Um, I, th I think I would say be intentional about, uh, be intentional about relationships. Um, I think you're only as wealthy as the relationships and support structures that you have yeah. and that you also give. Last but not the least. Okay. Uh, My father raised a number of girls, but I think he forgot to remind us that we're girls. <laughs> So, all I want to say to you is this. Your gender is irrelevant. Your vision and your ambition is the most important. Whatever you need to do that is right to do to live the life of your dream, do it and don't care what anybody else thinks. Thank you so much. We're very appreciative. I'm certain that every one of us, even including the men, we have picked a lot of tips that will help us in our career. Mrs. Aweshika, we're really appreciative that you made our time. Mrs. Adeshola, we are glad that you were able to make it and you've been able to share your personal experiences. And our Deputy Governor, she's one of us, Aisha Ahmad. She, we're very grateful as well that you were here and the fact that, you know, the vibrancy with which you spoke was touching. Thank you so much. Can we give them a round of applause, please?